Pacific State History Museum. And we are absolutely thrilled to be a part of this project and one of three sites hosting uh, the Orion vehicle on its way to the Kennedy Space Center. Um, I want to recognize a few special guests who are with us today. Uh, Representative Mike Asmuth and Representative Susan King. Thank you for joining us. Uh, also in the audience is Dr. David Carr, who was former chairman of the Texas Aerospace Commission. David, thank you. Um, you know, I think as humans we are constantly trying to explore the boundaries of our existence. And the Orion really represents the next chapter in manned uh, space exploration. Uh, and this weekend we've had a tremendous opportunity to, to see it live here. Um, the museum has a long history of partnering with NASA and Lockheed Martin. In 2009, we were lucky enough to have a live downlink feed from the uh, International Space Station uh, with astronaut Tim Cobra, who is an Austin native. And in 2010, uh, we were the recipient of an Expedition 20 coin that had traveled to the International Space Center. And it is currently embedded in the rotunda of the museum floor, and I hope you have a chance to see it after the program today. Uh, but now I'd like to turn this over to our guest, uh, David McAllister, who is with the Orion Flight Test Lead at NASA, and Larry Price, who is the Orion Deputy Program Manager for Lockheed Martin. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm Dave McAllister. Uh, I'm from Austin originally, so it's great to be back home. So I think thank you for the welcome over here. I'm actually. A, went to high school and uh, college here, so I went to the University of Texas. Actually, one of my professors showed up over here, so yeah. Professor Stearman, it's great to see him. How did he turn out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah still, still, you know, jury's out on that one still. But, uh, yeah, it's really, really great to be back home. One of the interesting things I've seen so far with Austin is uh, bringing this crew module out here, and I'll talk a little more about the crew module. But it's remarkable how smart and uh, intelligent the, the folks in Austin are and the kind of questions that we get. It's a very educated community, and uh, they not only understand, understand the science and technology, but they really understand what's happening with the crew module and the space program. So it's, it's really been interesting. Um, I'll give you guys more of an uh, up-close uh, description of the crew module one-on-one -on -one if you guys are interested. But I'd like to just say just a couple things. Uh, one, this was a very unique partnering uh, opportunity, this particular test with this particular vehicle, uh, between Lockheed Martin and NASA. It was a great opportunity. NASA actually built this crew module. Lockheed Martin uh, was the prime contractor for the uh, abort rocket, and uh, we really had an excellent team pulled together. So, you know, usually when people ask me, what's the, what's the most interesting or best part of working on this uh, crew module, it was the teaming effort and it was the people that we got to work with. Excellent uh, engineers across the country and uh, really over-the-top teamwork between NASA and the contractor. Now this crew module, if you guys don't know much about it, haven't heard about it, uh, we built this crew module just to test the abort system. So in the next phase of human exploration and uh, space access, we wanted to increase the level of safety for the astronauts. Uh, so NASA and Lockheed come up with this uh, abort system idea. It's basically a rescue system for the astronauts. This crew module was specifically built for that test. And it's actually originally designed to be a disposable vehicle. The test was so successful though, the uh, abort rocket test and the landing recovery system was so successful, we were able to recover this vehicle and bring it across the country, and take it back to uh, Kennedy Space Center, and hopefully we'll get the opportunity to fly it again. So. Uh, real, really uh, a testament to the engineering uh, efforts and the attention to detail that our team has. Um, the other big question that's come up uh, more than I expected on this vehicle, uh, from the kids especially, is how did you get this over the road uh, from California? And uh, once again, you just have to have a really, really good team. It's, it's a big, wide load, and uh, it's, it was tough to get it here. We're taking it to Kennedy. Um, that's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to Larry, and he'll talk about the future of this program. Thank you, Dave and Joan. Um, so where we're going, this is, uh, you probably heard, is designed to be a deep space exploration vehicle. 
So the whole Orion system is architected to be able to go to the moon and Mars and beyond. We've got plans that in the near term we could be flying in 2019 to an asteroid and rendezvous with an asteroid. So the idea is to have the vehicle as small as possible so you can have a usable sized crew, a crew of four, and be able to get them out into deep space. We have had over 500 people that have been into orbit in the history of space of all countries. But interestingly, only 24 have gone out of what we call low Earth orbit, which is two or 300 miles above the surface of the Earth, which is barely anywhere. So the advantage of this is we can start following what the robotic precursor missions, the rovers and imagers around Mars, the satellites that have gone out to the other planets, we can follow them with and be able to establish colonies and habitats and things and, and start exploring our solar system. So in the near term with Orion, uh, with this flight test article to validate the uh, abort system in early phases of flight that uh, Dave mentioned, we've got the um, first flight article uh, in assembly, final assembly, and it's going through what we call environmental test, where we put it in an acoustic chamber and determine what the environments inside the vehicle are with the very loud uh, outside environments from a launch vehicle and verify that we've designed all of the electronics and mechanical systems to tolerate that environment. In, the, in parallel, we're starting to build the, the flight article that we plan to fly in two years, in 2013. That'll go into a, what we call a high energy orbit. So we'll be able to go up 5,000 miles and come back in and re-enter the atmosphere and verify the design of the heat shield and our guidance and control system. And then about a year after that, we'll fly a, a, another abort test, like this vehicle was used for, but at what's called max Q, where the highest aerodynamic loads are, and their issues with stability, and verify that that same launch abort system performs in that regime. And then it'll be safe to fly crew, and be, because we'd be able to get them off in the initial flights. And maybe a year after that flight crew, we'll fly first flight in 13, abort flight in 14, crew in 16, go to the back side of the moon in 17, and there's this opportunity I mentioned with an asteroid in 19. So there's a real bright future for early deep space exploration with the plans that NASA's putting in place today. So it's been a really good opportunity to take this article, as Dave said, we were able to use and, and probably reuse, but move it from California, where the flight test was led from, uh, flown in, in New Mexico. And we can take it to Florida, to the Kennedy Space Center, and use it for production operations, check out Pathfinder, moving the vehicle around and such, so that assembly of the vehicles will be more cost effective. So in the opportunity to go across the country, we can uh, tag a few of the people to stop by and show it off on the way. And it's been great here in Austin. The, the enthusiasm, as Dave said, the intelligence and interesting questions and dedication of the parents and the children has been inspirational. So it's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. I just had one question, Larry. When do you think we'll have a moon on Mars? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Now that's, hey, Larry, you're not supposed to say that's a good question because that means other questions are bad questions. <laughs> that is a good question. You said repeat the question. Uh, the, que the first the question was, when will we have a woman on Mars? So, so can I dodge that and not answer that question, but sort of related ones? So far, the hard questions have been, when are we going to be able to put humans on Mars? That includes men and women, right? Um, and it's driven by a lot of uh, medical effects and things like that. We have to solve also, but we have to build the machines to be able to do it. The encouraging thing is that when Apollo was flying, this was really a, a male-dominated field. Test pilots, engineers and things, it was nerdy to do this kind of stuff. Now there are so many women involved in this program. I think a third of our program is, is women. A, four, a half of the program is, uh, are women and minorities. So the d distribution of, the, of uh, the diversity of the workforce is just phenomenal. So I think a woman will land on Mars the same time a man does. <laughs> Thank you.